Hello, everybody. My name is Reese Lindmark, and you're listening to another episode of Gray Mirror, a new podcast from MIT Media Lab's Digital Currency Initiative on technology, society, and ethics, where we look at both the positive and negative impacts of technology. So today I interviewed Joey Ito, who's the director of the MIT Media Lab, and he's a hyper-curious, jack-of-all-trades kind of guy. He's, for example, both on the board of the New York Times and is also part of early internet and digital cash movements. We chat about kind of two primary things, um, intervening in complex adaptive systems, which was the focus of his dissertation, and also applying that intervening in complex systems mindset to the cryptocurrency ecosystem. So I've three things to say on each of those. So let's start with the intervening in complex adaptive systems. So on that side, yeah, we talk about um, complex adaptive systems from a biological and a human perspective. And the first key point that we chat about is thinking about technology and markets as a process that are categorically different than biological processes. And you can see this in the sense that like the technology market processes create exponential curves while biological processes create S curves. The first ones create fragility while the biological processes create like resiliency. There are these open loops within technology and market processes, but closed loops in biological processes. And so when you take all these things into account, it's like, okay, these tech and market processes, unlike biological processes are kind of inevitably self-terminating. Um, And I guess for you as a listener, think about this in when you say, what are the problems of today? And one of the biggest problems, everything kind of boils down to this issue, this difference between these two processes that are technology and market processes um, are different than these uh, biological processes. So that's the first thing. Second thing we chat about is, so Joey says, okay, hey, therefore we need to change the paradigm. Therefore we need to kind of like change the game um, in order to make kind of new kinds of processes um, that will actually flourish us and self, self-sustain us to the future. And this is, this changing the paradigm mindset comes from Danella Meadows, who wrote this great book on thinking in systems. And you think about the leverage points within a system, and you can either be super symptom level or you can be super root causey and say, hey, if I want to go deeply and the root cause and change something, then I want to change the system's paradigm. So you can think of this in comparison. I like to contextualize this in comparison to something like Lawrence Lessig's pathetic dot. That theory just says, hey, you have, if you want to change something, you can change it through incentives, market incentives, through laws, through like code architecture, or through the norms. Um, and those four things, you can imagine paradigms um, as kind of one meta level abstracted above that to say, hey, um, instead of changing those four specific things, you can change the values of the paradigms and that will be manifest in the incentives, laws, architecture, and norms. So as I'll say, when you think about changing something in the world, think about are you operating at Lessig's level on one of those those four kind of sub points or are you operating at this meta level trying to change the paradigms and the values of the system and then have that be manifest in actual outcomes. Um, and then finally, when you think about these days, when you think about actually changing the system or the paradigm, um, one powerful way that Joey says to think about it, which I agree with, is if you think about the way that some of these biological processes work, something like viruses, um, when you put a like an antibiotic or antivirus killing thing, whatever, <laughs> into some system, um, the virus, the viruses already have resistance to that thing, to their new environment, and then they duplicate as given that new environment. So when you think about, when you kind of pattern match that into our world and map that into our world, you can think about our new environment these days as late stage capitalism, end of the industrial age, beginning of the information age. And instead of thinking, hey, we need to create something new, you can instead think, there's already existing resistance built into the human ecosystem. Um, And now that we're in this new environment, how can we take that existing resistance and use what Joey calls positive deviance, where you take something that's deviant in their environment, i.e. one of these viruses with a resistance, one of us in the world who has one of these cool new ideas, and how do you take something that's good and magnify and spread it? So that's just a mindset towards this. And I think that's a good way to think about when you're thinking about trying to change these systems, how you look in the world and you do an explore and you say, what are the current positive deviants in the system? And how can we then magnify those positive deviants so that they spread within the whole system? Um, cool. So those are three things on the system side. Now the three things when we take this mindset and apply it to cryptocurrency. Um, and the first thing I want to say is that, uh, so Joey again uses a biological perspective here and he thinks about at the beginning, with this great oxygenation event, there was a lot of oxygen and then it just rusted everything. Um, it was this byproduct that was just rusting things. And then only later was it used um, to create all this complex life that we know today. And so within the cryptocurrency world, we're pretty much in a situation like this right now where I think about when you look at the crypto world and you say, okay, what are the byproducts in the crypto world that are 
just right now they're rust. They're not actually being used for anything, but they might soon become um, these kind of building blocks for complex life. So that's something to think about as you think about the crypto spaces. What is currently, what is oxygen and what is it, how is it creating, what is the byproduct and how can instead it create complex life? Um, the second piece here is, you know, Joey wonders whether this future of economics and, and cryptocurrency, whatever, is it going to come from people inside the system or people outside the system? So for inside, there's something like putting financial raptors on crypto, um, you know, something like a an ETF, like a Bitcoin ETF, or vice versa, where you like tokenize securities. So those are wrappers around crypto or using crypto as a wrapper. But there are these other new things that are kind of just native, crypto native. So something like MakerDAO, like a new stablecoin might be a weird example of this. So this is when you think about the crypto world, think about is this thing crypto native or is it is it a wrapper on an existing financial um, instrument or is it being wrapped by a traditional financial instrument and possibly more importantly who is building it is it come some kind of noob you know kid who's you know coming from first principles who's a digital native or is it someone with like 30 years of experience so um and then this final third piece here is thinking about the internet versus crypto and kind of the progressions over time Joey has had lots of experience with both. And so, you know, one thing he talks about is these key standardization moments um, and how they haven't happened perhaps as much within the crypto world um, and standardizing bodies like ITF and W3C and whatever. Um, But I think more importantly, we talk about this idea that, and this big difference for him, which is that money is baked in to the crypto world. Um, And this was very different than the early internet days, which was based around fun. You know, people were just having more fun. Um, And then later that attention got the advertising business model hooked into it, but doesn't have this kind of natural money baked in vibe that the crypto and blockchain world has when you think about money being more difficult to remove or kind of being baked into the system i think uh you there are two responses one is what joey says which is hey you can reject that aspect and say you know what let's reject the money aspect of cryptocurrency it can't be traded and let's see what happens there kind of a constraints breed creativity approach or something that i think is super powerful is really deeply embracing the money side of it. And then saying, okay, we're deeply embracing the money side. We're creating programmatic money, abstracting money, we're abstracting trust. And really, when you think about money in that way, you can start to map people along Maslow's hierarchy of needs and where money fits in for them. For some people, it's a basic need and can help them move up the hierarchy of needs. And for other people, especially the people who are like building the technology these days, it's more on the self-actualization side where being able to change the incentives and the paradigms of the system itself are something that feels is very self actualize Okay, so with that, I hope you enjoy. We chat about systems and cryptocurrency, and I hope you enjoy today's episode with Joey. Hello, everybody. You're listening to Gray Mirror. Joey, thanks for being on the show, and welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, excited to chat. Um, and just as a warning to our listeners, Joey's my boss's boss, so I can't <laughs> hate on him too much, but you know, we'll, we'll, we'll do our best. Um, so today we're going to chat about two big buckets, mm-hmm. intervening in complex adaptive systems and then applying that to cryptocurrency more specifically. Mm-hmm. So let's kind of start at that meta abstracted level at the start and say, so you just wrote a um, your PhD dissertation. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, <laughs> and uh, it's about the central question in the book is, as you say here, how can we understand and effectively intervene in interconnected complex adaptive systems? Mm-hmm. So tell us, what's the answer? You know? <laughs> well... Well, first of all, it's it's it's, it's hard. Um, I think the, the the focus that I had was on um, adaptive um, complex systems like climate or uh, biological systems, um, and you know I think you know you, I guess your crowd is is is, is, a, is a cryptocurrency crowd. Um, you know you have complex adaptive systems like the market, but uh, you know I think the, the benefit that things like the Earth and our, the human body um, have had is we've had you know, billions of years of evolution, and so uh, you know if you look at the way in which different types of metabolic metabolic pathways work is you know there's oxygen and there's uh, 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 glucose and mm-hmm. and then something forms to then take somebody else's output and turn it into input for them to do a conversion and then do something else and yeah. and so there's you know, f- there's energy locked up in all different kinds of molecules, and different pieces of uh, 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 of the environment are are used by different things. And 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 when you look at um, so just if you go first of all, if you go all the way back to uh, uh, two or three billion years ago, when when uh, cyanobacteria first created 
uh, photosynthesis um, or photosynthesis that uh, created that converted uh, a carbon dioxide and water into um, into oxygen mm -hmm. and uh, uh, glucose. It, it was a it, you know it was it was a, it was a really interesting thing because back then um, most of the life on Earth didn't was anaerobic and didn't use oxygen yep. and it was you know, it's called the Great Oxygenation Event and it was one of the biggest extinction events that we've ever had mm -hmm. um, and all photosynthesis actually you know we think is is derived from that one mm -hmm. mutation that occurred um, and then you know later what you you see is and, and then and then we get multicellular organisms and, and you get you know, ATP and, and, and I think around you know I think s somewhere between 620 and 550 million years ago you get these multicellular organisms but they're pretty boring they're like mattresses that sit on the bottom of the ocean and and then, and then around 540 million years ago, you get what's called the Cambrian explosion, where you've got all these, the, the basic kingdoms of, 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 of life uh, emerge. And there's a lot of theories, but you, you start to see eyes, you start to see bone. And some people say, well, the bone was because there was calcium that was created as a byproduct of this. So, so everything is kind of a byproduct of something else. And it continues to evolve into a system that becomes quite resilient to the point where our body temperature is t typically pretty stable. And the Earth's temperature, until we screwed up, is usually pretty stable. Yep. Um, and markets don't do that. Markets no. don't self-heal. They don't self-stabilize. And, and there's no central planner in this um, Earth environment or in our, in our bodies. It's a completely decentralized system that's extremely robust and tends to uh, uh, adapt to all kinds of influences. And so that's kind of a really interesting thing. And that would be, wouldn't it be great if society... Um, you know, societal inequities or um, amplification of fluctuations in markets would somehow self-correct, and they don't. Yes. Got, you end up with regulators and involved with all this other stuff. And so, <laughs> and, and I think a lot of this has to do with the fact that um, you know, life was pretty simple until recently. I think you know, the industrial revolution was really about. Um, just trying to get more stuff, yeah. more abundance, because we didn't have enough fat calories. Yeah. We didn't have enough. Um, you know, we couldn't get around. There's, but but once we got more stuff more efficiently, um, now you look at like the reason I'm overweight is probably because calories are too easy to get mm -hmm. and life is too convenient. Yep. And um, social inequity, you know, you could argue is because capitalist systems have gotten so efficient at short-term extraction that um, that it, it you know it, it it really does make the powerful more powerful and 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 and, and you have the climate climate is mostly the problems that we see are caused by so more efficiently getting more stuff right so 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 to me the big problems right now which are the societal problems environmental problems and um, health problems are all the uh, outcome of being very successful in yeah. these linear things that we've done so these, this is not new for most of the people probably listening but but then how do you deal with and try to fix these problems and so when you listen to other people many people say oh we just need more entrepreneurship for poor people <laughs> or we just need more abundance like if you look at Peter Diamantes's book on abundance he opens up and he says imagine a world where we could feed every man woman and child on earth well we can we have the calories we just don't have a distribution mechanism and and people and I just had had an argument recently at a conference with an economist who still believes that if we just had enough abundance mm -hmm. um, the inequality will go away. Yeah. The pr problem is we've never gotten the inequality problem right, the redistribution problem right. Like racism, we start out with slavery, yep. we go to segregation, now we have mass incarceration. It hasn't really gone away. We yep. it's just we're, we've just changed form. So 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 my. In, in the conclusion, really, of, 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 the, of the dissertation is that um, you can change the rules and you can change all kinds of things, but you really kind of have to change the values in the yes. system. Yes. And I think the values are dictated by the paradigm that you have in how to think about things. And the paradigm that's right now dominant is the economics paradigm yep. of measuring GDP, measuring your... I mean, I, I know people on Wall Street who... who Tell me, how can he be smart? He's not rich, you know. So, 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 so measuring success through finance, um, and so, 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 I, I think that that's the, the paradigm of, of of cash, and the the sort of second order effect of measuring your value in terms of how much stuff you have is, I think, something that needs to change. I do think that when you t talk to some of the younger kids that we hang out with, that. 
they're less interested in making more money and they're more interested in, I mean, I'm 52, mm -hmm. they blame our generation for climate and all these other mm -hmm. things. Yeah. So I, I do think there's a, there's, there's a value shift going. Um, and so, so, so to me, the, 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 the really interesting question is um, how, how do culture shifts happen? How do paradigm shifts happen? And, and, and how does um, technology contribute to that? Sorry, I went Perfect. No, that is, that's, that's great. So I just want to recap what I to, and reflectively listen for a second. So A, I agree with you to say that you have kind of two categorically different processes, which are the biological, organic, bottom-up processes that are closed loops. They have inputs and outputs, and, and they work with what, what some of the systems folks would call like micro competition, but macro resiliency mm -hmm. versus our economic and market and tech processes, which just go for exponential curves and don't care about S loops essentially. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I agree with that. And then as you say, the second piece, we've, we're entering a new mode here. It's like we've had the industrial revolution mm -hmm. for the last, you know, 200 years or whatever. And it was a process of meeting a lot of our basic needs, starting to get us closer to this, you know, feeling of abundance. And, and now, now that we've kind of gotten it, we're kind of still in the old paradigm, but we need to kind of shift given our new needs. Mm -hmm. And then into the third piece that you talked about, which is, hey, yeah, so <laughs> if we want to shift, if it's the end of the industrial revolution, the beginning of the digital revolution, whatever you want to call it, um, we need to, if we keep going the way we're going, whether it's climate change or AI alignment or biotech or, you know, all these inequality, all these things, if we don't shift our values and our culture, we need to shift to something new. Mm -hmm. And the best way to shift to something new, as you say, is to kind of go as root causey as possible mm -hmm. and say, hey, let's shape the paradigms and the values of the system to be mm -hmm. something new. Um, so I agree. Yeah. <laughs> okay. so, 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 so there's this guy named Richard Pascal who <laughs> coined a phrase called positive deviance, mm -hmm. which is a, th a theory of change where instead of trying to change people's mind in the middle of the bell curve, mm -hmm. you look for places where somebody is doing something different but it's and it's working and then you try to amplify that right mm -hmm. and so so you know his examples were more sort of social but there's a you know a, a community where they had genital mutilation for women yeah. and the UN and others had been trying to get them to change forever but they went in and found that some families didn't do it and it turned out that it was when the girl who, who was a victim went to their mother right away and mm -hmm. talked about it and expressed how they had lost their trust, trust and so on. So then they said, okay, well, this is interesting. So when they, then the mom wouldn't do it to the next girl. Mm -hmm. So then what they started doing was having these community meetings after these genital mutilations mm -hmm. so that the moms started to like hear from the kids and that kind of spread and, and, mm -hmm. it, and, and it, 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 it was much more successful than years of sort of finger wagging from from, from the UN and, and and so to me weirdly you know it, it just, just have finding people who are doing it right and amplifying it and, and and the good thing is with 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 the internet we can see I mean like the Parkland kids are amazing right so they're very inspirational and you could have argued that how, how could a bunch of high school kids get 3,800 schools to walk out yeah. you could have probably proven that you couldn't do that but they just did it right and and I think Bitcoin is really neat because I remember when everybody was talking theoretically on the cypherpunks mailing so what if what if what well you just make it and then once you've made it then you can't argue against it right so so so, so I do think that experimentation and 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 doing things and um, and, and, and again, it's, it is kind of an evolutionary process, but I think like there, there's, a, there's an interesting um, uh, point about, um, say, drug-resistant bacteria, right? So, so usually when you have a drug-resistant bacteria, how it emerges is in the population of millions of bacteria, there already are a few mm -hmm. that have that gene mm -hmm. for drug resistance. And so once you start hitting it with the drug, what happens is the question is whether those few that have the drug resistance are able to multiply um, and and become dominant. It's not that they discover it as they're being hit. Mm -hmm. they, it already exists somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. So, so I, I kind of feel like uh, what what we're what we're looking for um, in terms of a culture shift, what we're looking for in terms of mechanisms, are all kind of out there somewhere, either historically in culture or now. Mm -hmm. And the question is, as we're starting to get pummeled by you know s stupid polarizing politics or an economy that's getting kind of funky. Um, do these weird, they could be ideas, they could be technologies, how do they come out and emerge to create a resistance um, mm -hmm. to the kinds of um, um, problems that we're being hit with right now? I think that's, it's more like a search process, which yeah. is what, you know, Martin Novak from um, the program yeah. Evolution Dynamics calls evolution, is he, he thinks it's just a search 
mechanism. Yep, yep. And it's kind of an explore than exploit is search mechanism. Yeah. Where it's like you, you do the exploration, and then hopefully we have systems in place such that the positive things mm-hmm. spread and the negative things don't spread. That's right. Um, <laughs> and, and, and it's about setting the, the, the I mean, if to use game dynamics, it's about setting the, 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 the payout mechanism in the yeah. game properly, which is, a, which is basically the, the paradigm, right? Yeah, exactly. So that, and, 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 and that's the other, there's a neat, um, uh, uh, paper also by Martin that showed that you know a lot of the really interesting things that you see in an evolved system like in a in a rainforest are actually collaborative uh, traits mm-hmm. right so 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 it's not just um, kill each other competition actually cooperative um, all the really interesting complexity that you see in a lot of systems are organisms learning how to have a cooperative relationships and I think that. Um, and also, he has another interesting paper that's on altruism, which shows that that if if if, if I tell you um, four dollar, you can do something that will give somebody else three dollars, mm-hmm. and that many people instinctively first say yes to that, mm-hmm. even though they don't get anything back, and then after a while they start saying, "Wait a second, I'm not getting anything," and then they mm-hmm. stop. But but this kind of altruism is actually hardwired to, for us to be more community oriented mm-hmm. and so if you can set up a mechanism to tap into um, people's desire to at their expense help the system but then give them enough feedback that's positive so that they continue to do that yep. rather than what we have right now which is you're just a sucker if you do that yeah totally yeah so and I think we should transition to crypto after this but I think that the I I think that's interesting and when I think about when I think about my highest hypothesis or the mechanism that I think will have the highest hypothesized chance of success is some kind of mechanism around we're in this new stage where a lot of people who are like you and I at the in hyper developed countries at very you know we money is not the thing we've moved up Maslow's hierarchy of needs towards self-actualization we can start to like self-tax ourselves and to think from an abundant non-accumulation non-scarcity mindset and so I think that this self-taxing idea actually and it comes a little bit from the effective altruism mm-hmm. movement love from mm-hmm. this ability to self-tax yourself and to push that money back into the system mm-hmm. um, I think that that from my experience thus far that's kind of been this once you start to think in that way mm-hmm. it's a little bit weird because at the beginning you're like why would I t- do this because it doesn't help me in this game and I don't get the returns back to myself yeah. but there are some various like frameworks like this thing egoistic altruism a couple other things that say hey if you do this it will actually be better so like my instinct is that everybody self-taxing themselves <laughs> will be the future but I think that that's an aggressive claim um, so with that let's um let's transition over to, into crypto and say so we're in the land of cryptocurrency um, that's the land that I most exist in it's the land that Joey sometimes touches as well and Joey has has been kind of um, interested in, in crypto and part of the digital cash movement for a long time. When you think about the cryptocurrency world now mm-hmm. and the trying to apply this you know complex system dynamics lens towards it and changing the paradigm, how do you see the crypto world as it is today? And and how do you see the what's the current paradigm and how does the paradigm need to change? Yeah. So so to use that earlier metaphor of sort of historical evolution, mm-hmm. you know, I I think that you know. Every man for himself is very much like a bunch of bacteria in the ocean. Yeah. And I think that our modern organizations are like those big multicellular organisms that just sit on the bottom of the ocean. They're interesting and they're big. Yeah. Um, there's some self-sacrifice going on. But what's interesting is if you think about you know just the fact that calcium became abundant, you could have shells and bones, and then, and then you had eyes and all these other things and so so to me cryptocurrency or just crypto let's say is kind of like there now is calcium in the water mm-hmm. and it could be used to create bones it could be used yeah. to create all these other things and so these multicellular organisms that in the past just kind of flailed around or just sat there um, might actually use this for other stuff now at the beginning it might be used in kind of pretty rudimentary ways like like a, a clam it just uses it as a shell or something like that but but I think you're, we're contributing a bunch of new materials that organisms can use. And, and to your point, I think that you know, we're starting to get into the phase of multicellular organisms where you start to sacrifice in order to gain attributes and stability. Because really a lot of multicellular organism stuff is about, you know, there's a lot less randomness when you get to a certain size, yeah. right? And, 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 it, and it helps all of the gut biome and everybody because now we can move around and, we, we, and they can be all at the same temperature, you know? And so, so I, I think that we will see, and hopefully it doesn't take billions of years, but we will see an evolution um, that comes from this. And I think that cryptocurrency, um, you know, is based on currency 
just like again, there there, there was um, uh, uh, different types of photosynthesis before cyanobacteria, but cyanobacteria was the first one that created that glucose oxygen combo that then goes into ATP and goes to the next thing. I do think that what we're seeing right now is is the availability of a really new uh, uh, a trait or 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 a currency thing that that I think um, if we use it properly. Um, um, we, it, it, it will evolve into the system. So, so that that's kind of where I, th what I think. And and, and, and again, I, I feel like, um, you know, the, the the earlier uses of oxygen was just to rust everything. You know, it didn't really wasn't that useful. It was only until much later that it was, you know, we, we figured out you know this through the ATP cycle on how to use it as energy, right? And so so I I feel like right now you know cryptocurrency we we think about it very much like money because we think about it in, through the lens of, of traditional economics and, 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 and progress and growth oriented ethics but but to me what's really interesting is is, is what kinds of um, thinking is emerging and to me to be honest like when I listen to kids um, who are in the in the crypto world um, you know they, they're coming up with really creative <laughs> new ways of thinking about yeah. economics and redistribution and yeah. things like that yeah. things that normal economists can't yeah. think of because they they don't have the freedom to think in terms of um, of structures that 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 crypto in, in, enables and 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 the question for me which is sort of um, I don't know the answer to but is an interesting question if you look at historically the beginning of the industrial revolution um, it was actually the so you had these artisans that like the shoemaker had apprentices and journeymen and they're all single right things and. Um, and the first factories were created by those masters mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. who were funded for the first time with the first capital from these yeah. traders, right? But but it wasn't some outsider, it was actually the mm -hmm. artisans themselves. Mm -hmm. And they said, you know what? I'm, you're fired, now you work for me as as a, as a, as a as this fungible thing. Yeah. Um, and so the question that I have is the future of the economy, is the future of all this going to come from people who know a lot about money? Mm -hmm. Or is it gonna come from people who don't know anything about money? <laughs> that come out from left field. I don't know if you yes. have an opinion. Yes, oh, so uh, <laughs> lots of opinions on these things. I think so, A, I agree with you that you have um, that, that, that calcium uh, primitive that you talked about from a biological perspective. I think within the crypto world, like trust might be that primitive in this, mm -hmm. in this world, and that trust can be used, I mean, for something like, it can create totally new paradigms with something like, once you have that m new kinds of money built on trust, then you can start to build these weird new ecosystems. And I'd say the one that comes to my mind is this weird DeFi ecosystem, both with stuff like Lightning Network, but also mm -hmm. on the Ethereum world, where you have like MakerDAO and Compound and there are all the uh, Dharma and derivatives and it's all this weird new parallel kind of financial system that's kind of popping up yep. that they're all interoperable with each other in this weird way. It's like, it's very hard to tell where it's going, but you just know they're all kind of working with each other all the time. Yep. Yep. Um, so that's that's part of this. I think um, the sacrificing to get stability point that you made is interesting. We're starting to see it within the crypto world as well, where people are starting to self-tax themselves to some extent to say, hey, I know we need to fund infrastructure in order to for my company to succeed or whatever or to, for the ecosystem to succeed so we're starting to see a little bit more of the kind of sacrifice for the greater good part um, in terms of on the non-tech side and in terms of on the kind of <laughs> the, the, the creative kids these days who are thinking about money in, in weird ways I think it's funny because in theory I'm one of these kids these days to some extent but I'm also not even I'm 27 and I'm not a full digital native and so to think my perspective is like pretty much like, I don't really know about traditional economics, I don't really care about the banks, you know, like, let's do things in a different way. But even the kids who are like 19 or whatever, it's like, Bitcoin makes more sense to them than something like fiat yeah. money. And that's just like, that's weird. So, so I agree with you that my instinct is uh, with these new people who are thinking these new ways from these weird new first principles perspectives, we're going to see something different. Um, so I want to ask another question as our final wrap up question here, which is, if you think about, so you were part of the... Um, the early internet days and thinking about the early internet and how, how that kind of um, let a, a thousand flowers bloom and whatever. How do you see the progression of the early internet versus the progression of the blockchain and crypto world and how the blockchain and crypto world can perhaps learn from or maybe is different from the internet progression? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so I, I think the early internet, because there wasn't that much money involved, it was really about how do we create a network so that we can share Porn probably yeah. was mostly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Um, but it was the news groups and stuff like this communication, right? Yeah. Um, and yeah, Bitcoin because it has a financial piece. Um, I think that that's that's a big difference, and I think mm -hmm. it's forced people mm -hmm. into 
doing for profits. So I think there are a lot fewer people doing it just for fun. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a really big difference. And I, I think, you know, and I hung around, I've hung around with the cypherpunks for a long time. Cypherpunks are really different than the original internet people because the original internet people were, you know, mostly friendly with government, mm -hmm. mostly academic, whereas cypherpunks tended to be kind of anti-establishment. Um, now, having said that, all, all of us have gotten older, you know, <laughs> and, um, and I, I think, you know the the the, uh, uh, the 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 cultures change, but it, but it's it's still it's it still has that difference. I think the thing that I've been saying, and I don't know if it's absolutely true, but I I I, I think it is, which is, um, you know, the, 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 there there are a lot of key standardization moments on the internet, whether it's TCP/IP or or you know HTTP and HTML, or or even Ethernet at some level, and. And and, and and there were other periods where we had competing networks. So, so I still remember when we had like Novell Networks and Apple Talk and mm -hmm. Token Ring and all these things and it was competitive and everybody's like, yeah, and there'll never be a standard, it'll just be a network of networks. That's not true. You know, eventually you start to standardize around the, the thing. And and the, and the standard is not necessarily always the best technically. Yeah. It's usually the, I remember I was talking to um, Jun Murai who worked on a lot of the early um, uh, address stuff, and, and he said, you know, there was actually a conversation about having variable length addresses. Um, it wasn't that hard, but they said, you know, but it will increase the number of people who can write network code mm -hmm. if we make it simple. Mm -hmm. And so, so there was this really interesting design of protocols of trying to make them easy to explain, mm -hmm. easy to deploy, so they scale. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I don't think we've gotten there yet, first mm -hmm. of all. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think people are trying that hard to make it really easy, although I think Ethereum community is probably better at it than others. I also think that we don't have a standard. I still feel like we're, like we have, you know, you know, to me, you know, Zappo is CompuServe and, um, <laughs> um, um, and, and, and Coinbase is like the source. And I think we're still, you know, and, and you know, and, 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 and Bitcoin is BitNet and, and <laughs> Ethereum is, you know, Apple Talk or something <laughs> like that. And so, so I, I still feel like the standard's not there. Um, I. I'm not positive, but I do think that there, there, there will be some sort of standardization, and, and that will allow a much more robust thing. And so, so like the early now, having said that, you know, if if, if Coinbase is AOL, AOL still exists, but it's it, but it, you know, it, it first got rid of their little CDs, and it got rid of their modems, and as each layer became standardized, it it moved to a different space. I, I don't know if that model is definitely true, but but I, but I but I think it's roughly true. I think that, and and the problem also is that all of these standards. Typically, we get um, uh, managed by non-governmental, um, uh, non-profit entities like the IETF or, um, or you know, the W3C and others. And and I, I haven't seen that emerge. Um, again, I, I I may be I, I may be totally wrong, but I feel like we're still in that early competing standards period. Um, but anyway. yeah, I, th I think that that's I mean that's pretty much true. And I think that like you said at the beginning, I think the cr crucial piece is that. It's the fact that money's baked into the system is it just totally changes the vibes. It both creates some people who are interested in purely from a greed perspective, you know, yeah. and it creates some people who are into it from a pure technical perspective. Mm -hmm. But then you have to kind of choose one of those two, and if you're in the middle, then you're gonna there's venture capitalists everywhere. There's yeah. all kinds of and a good example of this is um, Grin, and there's this new cryptocurrency or new protocol called Mimblewimble, and this new mm -hmm. coin called Grin, um, and. When Bitcoin was first released, people were, no one knew about it, and so it was just Satoshi mining on yeah. his GPU for a while, CPU. Um, with Grin, people estimate like a hundred million dollars of uh, mining equipment, and it's yeah. not even out yet. And so it's like it's a different, yeah. it's a different well, ballgame. So, so I'd be, i be, you know, I've always been hoping that somebody could create some sort of currency or token that was not allowed to be traded for anything that had any financial value, mm -hmm. you know, or something like that. Mm -hmm. So something that mm -hmm. just technically disabled it from having any financial value and, and, but 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 that exhibited interesting properties or something like that because because I, I do think that you don't have to have financial value in cryptocurrencies it's just that that's kind of the default right and and, and I feel like you know we're, we're, once the tools get a little bit more mature I think that you know people will 
try to think about those sorts of things. Yeah. And, you know, and, and again, it, then it starts to avoid a bunch, you could do really crazy yeah. things and avoid a bunch of regulations, stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, that would be nice. Um, kind of a worse is better vibe. Um, yeah. Okay, sweet. So with that, we're out of time. Um, uh, but A, for our listeners, um, you can go check out um, the name of your PhD is Practice of Change? The practice practice of, change. of Change. I actually honestly recommend it if you're into tech ethics or systems or the history of the internet. Um, and uh, so check that out. And then Joey, where can people find you on Twitter? Just at Joey, J-O-I. At, at J-O-I. Also, we both work at the Media Lab. It's fun over here, so if you want to work here, let us know. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, thanks so much, Joey. Thanks a lot. Peace.